buy Mother Nature one cheap cocktail a month, and you've taken care of her. Tonight on The Fifth Estate, he's been called a geo-vigilante, an eco-terrorist, a visionary who simply wants to save the world. It's almost like putting a teaspoon of our uh, multivitamin iron mineral. That's all the ocean needs to come back to health. For years, American businessman Russ George has nurtured a controversial idea, fix global warming by seeding the ocean with iron. We have a, a corporate mantra, and that is save the world, make little money on the side. But environmentalists are dead set against it. We told him straight out if he attempted to do this project within the area near the Galapagos that we would physically intervene to stop him. So how did the man who once sold the Vatican on a non-existent forest get away with it? Thumbing his nose at UN conventions and possibly Canadian law to carry out his grand experiment off BC's coast. News broke of a massive project to try to absorb carbon. Russ George dumped the iron to spark an artificial plankton bloom. And how did he convince this impoverished Haida village to pay for it? You're dealing with a man who primarily uses as his tools smoke and mirrors. I honestly believe his work that he's doing is the right thing to do. Good evening, I'm Gillian Finley. It was a story that made headlines around the world. A tiny First Nations village perched here on the edge of a continent had taken a hundred tons of iron-rich dirt, sailed 200 nautical miles out that way, and dumped it in the Pacific Ocean. Ecologists and scientists were outraged. The Haida, stewards of one of the most celebrated ecosystems in the world, were vilified. But at the center of it all, and staying well away from the spotlight, was an American businessman who'd been trying to peddle this kind of experiment for more than a decade, and who, in the people of Old Masset Haida Gwaii, found a partner desperate to believe. According to Haida legend, it's the place where time began. But as rich as it is in beauty and tradition, these times are not easy in Haida Gwaii. Gone are the fish and the economy they supported. In the village of Old Masset, nothing has filled the gap. So when eco-entrepreneur Russ George rolled into town seven years ago, promising to reap new riches from the sea, Old Masset was ready to listen. Chief Councillor Ken Ray. How much did you know about Russ George and his background? Well, I, to be honest, I, I knew what everybody else knew with, through the internet. And I think it's fair to say he's got a very controversial yeah, reputation. Yeah, but he's, he also has a reputation. He also has a great deal of knowledge and respect in the, in, the, in the fields as well. You know, there's a lot of noise about him. I first met Russ George in the mid-80s. The issue then was dead whales. The fisheries department now says it will do tests to find out just how poisonous BC waters are. George was no whale expert, but that didn't stop him expounding like one. The medical pathologist is saying died of acute liver toxic necrosis. I think there's more than a simple, you know, guess to connect these things, these these deaths. Solid state physics shows us the way that we can exp we can get two nuclei together. It's that kind of brash confidence that helped him make a name for himself through many careers as tree planter, fish farmer, self-styled conservationist. George has always been passionate about science and the environment, especially when they can be combined to make a profit. We have a, a corporate mantra, and that is save the world, make little money on the side. By the end of the 90s, he landed on what seemed a perfect investment vehicle, climate change. In particular, a theory of using the world's oceans to reduce greenhouse gases in the air. It wasn't original, but George became one of its biggest promoters. Here he is, pitching it on Dutch TV. Well, I'm on the Stad Amsterdam. Uh, I came here to tell the story of about the decline of the ocean pastures and how the oceans need a little dust uh, to bring back the productivity. The dust is iron sulfate, 
Scientists have long known that iron is needed to grow plankton, those huge blooms of microscopic organisms that are the backbone of the ocean's food chain. As it grows, plankton absorbs carbon dioxide from both the sea and the atmosphere. The theory is that when the plankton dies, it takes the captured carbon with it, burying it forever, says George. In result, healthier oceans and cleaner air. And the beauty, it doesn't take much. We know that if we put as little as, uh, almost, it's almost like putting a teaspoon of our uh, multivitamin iron mineral into a square kilometer of ocean, that that's all the ocean needs to come back to health. He started his experiments off Hawaii on a schooner he boasted had been loaned to him by singer Neil Young. He says he did create a plankton bloom, but what he really wanted to prove was that the bloom did in fact capture carbon. That's because by 2002, carbon sequestration, as it's called, was starting to equal money. It all goes back to the Kyoto Accord, that agreement countries, including Canada, signed to reduce greenhouse gases. Among the incentives was the creation of a kind of market, a place where countries or companies that produce too much carbon could buy credits from those who'd succeeded in removing it by installing new technologies, for instance, or planting trees, or if Russ George had his way, by growing plankton. His problem was that of all the scientific experiments, there'd been more than half a dozen by then, none had shown definitively that plankton could capture carbon, at least not in any significant way. To be the first, George needed money. He formed a company called Planktos, bought a research vessel and hit the road looking for investors. So if we can take carbon dioxide and capture it in an ocean plant up here, and most of it, and much of it gets eaten, and some of it heads down, anything that gets down below here is gone forever, right? It's gone for longer than the duration of the fossil fuel age, right? So it's a... It's it was only a theory, but that didn't stop him pitching it as fact or selling carbon credits off his website. Among his biggest backers was Vancouver real estate tycoon Nelson Scalbania. He'd done time for misleading investors. But in spite of that past, George called him his green angel, a man who believed like he did in the power of the market to fix the world. A message so compelling, even the US Congress wanted to hear. Buy Mother Nature one cheap cocktail a month and you've taken care of her. It's part of the solution and it also heals the harm that's done. But it was when the Planktos literature started promising returns of 2,000 percent that George started facing scrutiny. Yeah, historically, uh, he, he, he had a company called Planktos. Um, Among the first to question was an environmental action group called Etcetera. Jim Thomas is their research manager. I mean, the, 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 a Planktos carbon credit was a, was, a, was a pretty looking piece of paper with a gold seal on it. Um, that said, Mother Nature thanks you for your business, and um, we've, for your five dollars, we've now taken carbon out of the atmosphere. There's nobody behind that checking. Um, in fact, at the point when they were issuing that, they hadn't really even done any significant ocean fertilization. That's what Russ George intended to change, prove to the world and to the market that ocean fertilization worked. But it was when they learned just where he wanted to test his theories that environmentalists really freaked out. The pristine waters of one of the most protected ecosystems in the world, the Galapagos Islands. We were pretty horrified. Once we discovered that they were aiming to go to the Galapagos Islands, we, we contacted uh, allies in Ecuador, we contacted the Ecuadorian government, we contacted the, um, the Galapagos National Park and discovered that they weren't aware of this at all and they were equally horrified. Horrified because scientists have long warned that while it's easy to create a plankton bloom, it's just as easy to screw things up. To think that we can alter fundamentally ecosystems and figure it's going to be good, I'd say there's a real risk there. John Cullen of Dalhousie University has led the fight against commercial fertilization. He worries that capturing too much carbon in the ocean can reduce oxygen levels, create dead zones in which nothing can live. What's more, it can increase other greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide, 
hundreds of times more dangerous than CO2. And the scientific argument is, if those consequences cannot be predicted with confidence and verified with measurements, then the activity should not be permitted. And yet, in the fall of 2007, Russ George set sail anyway, loaded with the equivalent of 10 dump trucks of iron dust, headed for the South Pacific. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency warned him he'd be breaking anti-dumping laws, but the EPA would soon be the least of his problems. 30 years ago, the ocean was a lawless place. It was, in fact, the environmental community that took George on, in the lead, a man with a long history of battling ocean predators. Yeah, this is Paul Watson. Introduce you to Captain Paul Watson. I've got a statement here from our clients, so we're going to play that on the loudspeaker. Uh, we told him straight out if he attempted to uh, do this project within the uh, in the area near the Galapagos that we would physically intervene to stop him. Today, Paul Watson and his Sea Shepherd Society still patrol the seas. We reached him en route to confront Japanese whalers off the Antarctic coast. Uh, he then actually cancelled those plans and moved on to Bermuda. And uh, we met him in Bermuda. And then he moved on um, uh, across to, uh, I believe, to the Canary Islands. And they put pressure on him, too. And then when he crossed over uh, the ocean, we just followed him everywhere he went. We just made sure that the governments that uh, uh, concerned were, were, were aware of what he was planning to do and the implications of that. While the chase continued on the high seas, back in Montreal, Jim Thomas was lobbying for international rules to stop George. In November, representatives of 35 countries met in London to adopt a moratorium against George's brand of so-called science. And this moratorium was in large part, or maybe exclusively, because of was, what Russ George was yeah, planning to do? Yeah, it was prompted by what Russ George was planning to do. Um, so we, we then had two international moratoria in place. And, and since then, there's actually been even further um, agreements through, through other bodies. Um, and yeah, Russ George very much precipitated that. George's dream appeared to be dead. Investors pulled out, and by the next year, Planktos was bankrupt. The environmental world assumed Russ George had taken his theories and gone away. Until last summer, and news from a place often called the Galapagos of the North, Haida Gwaii. When we come back, the new investors and what they were promised. He said these are low estimates. We would. Um, see a balance of $29 million. The people of Haida Gwaii, B.C. have a long history of fighting to protect their unique environment. Anti-logging protests in the 80s resulted in the creation of one of the world's most important and celebrated ocean and park reserves. But the victory didn't do much to help the economy. For generations, that was driven by the salmon until the stocks all but disappeared. Old Masset is still reeling, and Chief Counselor Ken Ray is at a loss. What's the unemployment rate, would you guess? Um, I would say upwards of 70 percent. Upwards of 70 percent? Yes. And, that and I could comfortably say that. And that breeds all kinds of other problems, I guess. Absolutely. Just around the corner here is our, one of our processors, our big processor. I don't believe it's been open in the last year. And when, the, when the industry was really, really going, there was upwards of 100 people there. We need help. There's only so, nobody's going to help us. There's no investment there. But there's nothing, nobody's coming to invest. Nobody's, there's nothing coming here. Enter Russ George. Together with a man named John Disney, a former business partner who also happens to be Old Massett's economic development officer, George convinced the council there was money to be made from the ocean again by growing plankton to suck carbon dioxide out of the air and selling the credits on a newly established international market. But he wasn't going to put up the seed money. 
the council would have to convince the village to do that. What the project needed was cash and a community commitment to borrow it. Two and a half million dollars, a lot in a struggling community like this. But in a series of town meetings, the people of Old Masset were assured they could not lose. He implied that this was a desperate situation and that nobody was going to help the people and they really needed this. This was going to be their salvation. Gloria Tauber was one of only a handful who showed up to the first meeting to hear John Disney make the pitch. He said that this project would bring in so much money that everybody would have jobs because um, he had customers already lined up to buy the carbon credits from rich uh, industries in Europe. By the second meeting, they were talking numbers, big numbers. And April White, an artist and a geologist, made a point of taking notes. He said these are low estimates that $2.5 million would bring um, $13.5 million, but the actual profit would be about $8 million. In one year? year? We were to then reinvest the profit, and the next year we would um, see a balance of $29 million. So in two years, he was saying $29 million was going to come into this community as a result of selling these credits? Exactly. And it was, was this a possibility, or was he saying that this was a sure thing? He told us it was a sure thing, guaranteed or insured against sales even. It was done? He had a buyer for He them? had a buyer. He, he also said that Rush George, the chief scientist behind this, he, he knew how to do everything and that he had proprietorial knowledge to prove that. Now the truth is, in the spring of 2011, there was still no market for carbon that had been captured in plankton because there was still no proof it could be done. So really, there was nothing to sell. But that, it seems, has rarely been an impediment to Russ George. The next talk is uh, given by Russ George of uh, D2 Fusion Inc. His list of investment projects and companies is as long as it is dubious. Before there was plankton, there was cold fusion, another fringe theory. The promise of cheap, low-energy nuclear power that George told investors he'd harnessed into a home heating unit. I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, results that I have gotten over these uh, almost 16 years that I've been working in this field. On, the heating uh, unit never materialized. In all, there were close to two dozen companies, including a tree planting company called Klimafa. By then, the pitch was all about carbon, and George is nothing if not a compelling pitcher. Look, you're dealing with a man who primarily uses as his tools smoke and mirrors. Journalist Stephen Crivet covers the field of emerging technologies. Russ George has been on his radar for more than a decade. He's a risk taker. He really doesn't care a lot about what his critics say or think. Oh, and then there was the Vatican thing. The Vatican thing. Back in 2007, the church announced a new initiative to encourage green technology. Sensing an opportunity, George rushed to Vatican City, promising to make it the first carbon-free state in the world by virtue of thousands of trees he was going to plant in Hungary. Pictures of him donating the supposed carbon credits went worldwide. The Cardinal, I'd like to present to you this certificate from our company, Klimafa. And on behalf of the Vatican, we will now be planting a new Vatican forest. Oh, this was an amazing publicity stunt. He didn't have any carbon credits. He did not have a forest in, 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 in Europe that had grown yet. To this day, the mayor of Tisokeshi, Hungary, has no idea what happened to his village's promised Vatican forest. Not a single tree was ever planted. Klimafa also declared bankruptcy, another of George's failed attempts to turn science into profit. There's nothing wrong with profit, but you have to have your science first. 
you have to have a foundation of science. Uh, Russ doesn't seem to be too concerned about having a, a scientific foundation before he starts asking people to invest. Is he a scientist? I don't think so. Does he have academic credentials as a scientist? Do you know? I've asked him about his credentials and he gave me an evasive answer and he, he didn't offer that he had any credentials. What we've learned is that George attended the University of Utah. He never graduated. Back in Old Masset, they claimed they did their research on Russ George and still came out believers. And I honestly believe his work that he's doing is the right thing to do. But you knew, for instance, that he had tried to do this in the Galapagos, and he had tried it in the Canary Islands, and he'd been driven out of both of those places. So you knew he'd been investigated by the EPA in the United States. You knew these things about him. I knew these things, and I know, I know his version as well, and it'll be his story to tell you if he, if he chooses to do so. But Russ George doesn't choose to tell his story, at least not to us. He no longer trusts the media, he says. The only audience he cares about now are the people of Old Masset. But like every good performer, George knows how to cater to what an audience wants to hear. And as those community meetings continued in 2011, the message, as delivered by John Disney, began to shift. No longer was it all about the money they'd earned by selling carbon credits. Now there was a higher purpose, one old Masset could not resist, the salmon. Salmon is very much a part of the culture. I like to say we're salmon people. It's um, what connects us to nature. For the salmon not to come back in the same um, numbers is, is a real trauma. It's, you know, like it really is a heartfelt thing. When you're a fisherman, you're a fisherman. There's no other life out there for you but to live on that ocean. Vince Collison's family has earned a living off these shores for generations. So when the talk turned to enhancing salmon stock, he wasn't the only one who was all ears. I'm just hoping that at the end of the day, we're able to start getting more of our people back on the water and back on boats. And, and the way to help that out is to make sure that there's fish for us to catch out there. There would be George promised if only there was more plankton. And again, he played the scientist. In 2010, after decades of decline, BC actually had a bumper crop of salmon that experts are still at a loss to explain. George claims it was all because of a volcanic eruption in the Gulf of Alaska in 2008. Tons of iron-rich ash spread across the Northeast Pacific, which in turn created masses of new plankton blooms. Two years later, 34 million salmon returned unexpectedly to the rivers of the West Coast. With the two incidents linked, the village's economic development officer, John Disney, certainly seemed to think so. He showed pictures of that volcano and um, a graph of how the salmon stocks had uh, multiplied during that time. They definitely said it was proven link. And he was saying to people, we know that there's a connection between those two things? Absolutely. He, he said, um, when people were going, how can this be proven? He goes, nature tells us. Not science tells us, nature. I think it was about trust. They trusted him, absolutely trusted him. And I think that's, that's why there was the um, salmon component, because uh, without the salmon, I don't think he could have sold the, the story. But sell it, he did. The proposal to invest two and a half million dollars from a community trust fund passed with 66% of the vote. The village of Old Masset was now a partner in the newly named Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation. Among the other partners with a big financial interest was CEO and chief scientist, Russ George. Five years after he'd been forced to abandon his grand experiment in the South Pacific, George was back. And last summer, in the deep waters of the North Pacific, the deed was finally done. When we come back. I've known Russ for over 10 years, and I'll tell you something that is very rare. I've never, he's never once lied to me. He's only told me the truth. 
He has a great integrity and he's never let us down. Summer after a decade of trying, Russ George finally succeeded in carrying out his iron fertilization project in the waters off Haida Gwaii. There was no media there to witness what happened. These pictures were posted later on the Haida Salmon Restoration Company's website. No one knew how much iron they'd put into the ocean or when or where. The crew was forced to sign confidentiality agreements, promising not to speak. But it's hard to keep a secret in a small place. And by mid-October, news leaked out. Old Massett was soon in the middle of an old-fashioned media firestorm. This week, news broke of a massive project to try to absorb carbon. Russ George dumped the iron to spark an artificial plankton bloom. George allegedly lied to the native Haida Nation. It will promote the growth of this phytoplankton. And The questions kept coming. Who knew? Who authorized? What about those international conventions designed to protect oceans from unregulated ventures like this one? But doing so in violation of two UN conventions is flat out ballsy. An American businessman dumped 100 tons of iron sulfate into the ocean uh, off of BC's west coast this summer. And <coughs> scientists are puzzled because this, this experiment may have breached an international moratorium. Environment Canada was not asked to approve this apparent violation of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Environment Canada did not approve this uh, non-scientific event. Uh, and uh, enforcement officers are now investigating. Now the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation was on the defensive. But Russ George wasn't there to take the hard questions. Thank you for attending our press conference here at the Vancouver, Vancouver Aquarium. I'm the elected chief counselor for the village of Old Massa. It was left to Chief Ken Ray to do the explaining, revealing that a hundred tons of iron dirt had been dumped. Iron in the ocean is a natural thing. It is not as pollution as some of the recent press have indicated. Side effects to that. According to Economic Development Officer John Disney, they'd acted responsibly. The ocean was doing just fine. So far from our study of the research, they've found none of the negative side effects that people are worried about, like making dead zones, eating up the oxygen. In the days that followed, the company posted a satellite photo showing a giant plankton bloom it claimed George and his fertilization team had created. But oceanographer John Cullen isn't so sure. The warm colors mean more chlorophyll, more phytoplankton, and the cold colors mean less. Plankton blooms naturally in the eddies off Haida Gwaii, he says. There's no way of knowing if the artificial fertilization grew anything. We can't tell from this what would have occurred if that ship had not been out there dumping iron. So I can't tell you that it did not create a bloom, but one thing is for certain, it's not possible from this to say how much of that bloom is due to any iron that may have been added. Given that this is a picture for a month, this bloom in theory could have been building before they even put the iron ore in, is that right? That's correct. But Chief Ray was convinced, and at the press conference, he insisted the plankton would bring the fish back. Once again, pointing to that 2008 volcanic explosion that George claimed produced that bumper crop of salmon. We undertook the step of restoring the salmon in the ocean. The success of our project will be measured when the salmon return to our waters. But Brian Riddle isn't holding his breath. He spent 30 years studying BC salmon, and says the 2010 run had little to do with deep ocean plankton and everything to do with conditions closer to shore. There's no question that the volcanic eruption and the, uh, it's all the micronutrients, not just iron, fertilizing the Alaska gyre probably did stimulate the phytoplankton production. Now, whether that actually can be related to the huge return of Fraser Saka in 2010, almost certainly not. So the volcanic activity had nothing to do with that? No, I mean, and in all honesty, that's been rejected in two or three papers submitted for review and it's not been published. I'm sure that the people of Massett 
would trust somebody that says, well, this is the way we're going to bring your fish back, then they'll be anxious to do that. Uh, but um, unfortunately, it's not going to be that simple. Even in the face of serious scientific criticism, the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation stood its ground. Among its many defenses was the claim that seven different federal government ministries knew about the project before it happened, including the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. They even cited meetings with specific department scientists. Among the names, DFO Emeritus Scientist Frank Whitney. Years ago, he was part of a small, carefully controlled fertilization project himself. He believes there are things to be learned about how oceans react to iron. But like most scientists, he's strongly against fertilization for profit. He and a colleague did meet Russ George last spring. It didn't go well. Russ was not interested in hearing about other ideas. He, he wanted uh, validation of his pro approach, I think, uh, that iron enrichment was a, an important thing to do. And uh, neither Tim nor I were willing to make that statement. We didn't feel it was safe to just head off in the ocean and dump iron. And when, when you told him that, what did you say? That's where things got a little contentious. He, he didn't really want to have a, an exchange of ideas on, uh, down that avenue. In fact, the government agencies George and his partners say they contacted tell us they were never told the project was about iron fertilization. Even NOAA, the prestigious American Ocean Administration, which did give the corporation 20 satellite tracking buoys, now tells us it was misled. And I was told that they were not misled. By whom? I was told by my team. And what did your team say? That, that they had been... That 20 buoys were being lent to the project to help get, get, gather data and on it. it. And more specifically, I, I can't answer all the, when I wasn't part of that conversation. Why are they now saying they didn't know? It's easier to say we didn't know. Whatever the truth, it's clear one government branch did know something was up. When news broke that the iron fertilization had taken place, Environment Canada let it be known that on May 7th, two months before George and his team set sail, officials met with the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation and warned them not to go ahead. I did not attend the meeting on May 7th. Who attended on behalf of the corporation? John Disney. And what did John Disney tell you about what happened at that meeting? It was uh, in, to inform them what we're doing and keep them posted. Did he that was the gist of it. Did he tell you that he was told at that meeting that this would not be a wise thing to do and that it may well be in contravention of Canadian law? No. I, I, I never heard that report back. Is it possible that he just didn't tell you that? Possible. Because that's, in fact, what Environment Canada says, is that your corporation was advised not to do this. I'll have to see the evidence to that. I, when I spoke to the same, very same people, they never said that to me. And as chief of the village, you'd think they'd inform me of that. Hello. We wanted to interview John Disney, but Chief Ray refused to let him talk. As for Russ George, we'll show you that when we come back. Mr. George. Hello. Jillian Finley from CBC, Fifth Estate. How are you? months after they poured tons of iron dirt into these waters, tensions over what Russ George and the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation did have not gone away. If anything, anger is building all over Haida Gwaii. But Russ George is nowhere to be found, which leaves Chief Ken Ray once again having to field the questions. The worst thing that could happen is that if you extra salmon do come back and you have every little village on the coast dumping stuff in the water. Like, that, that's not nature, you guys are playing God. What, like, what makes you think that you, John Disney, and Russ George have the authority to do that and drag the rest of us through what well, well do so? We're not playing God. What's God got to do with science? Gosh, Very methodically. You guys should have avoided all this by, by putting Russ George out there when, when the shit hit the fan. Instead, you held a press conference that was basically a Russ George promotional video and you dragged the rest of us through the mud can. That's what happened. 
People say you're naive. You got taken in by Russ George, yeah. he spun you a tail, he got your money, and you're never going to see a return on this. Well, I guess time will tell. I've never really been called naive before. And I like to think I've done the work I, I need to do to, to qualify the uh, decisions that were made. But there are other questions too, bigger ones. For instance, if Environment Canada knew of George's plans last May, why did they do nothing to stop him? And having said the operation appeared to violate Canadian law, why has the government still taken no action? The official story is that the government is still investigating, eight months later. We've tried repeatedly to speak to Environment Canada officials to interview Environment Minister Peter Kent, but they've all refused. The lack of government action worries environmentalists and scientists alike. I, I feel that Canada has to make a statement of some kind uh, because I can imagine that without some sort of sanctions against this kind of work, we'll see another iron enrichment study next year. We could see one that's uh, ten times larger. We, it, you know, it's, it's, if, if uh, people realize that Canada is open for this kind of business, then money could come to this kind of activity. Under Canadian law, dumping anything into the ocean without permission is illegal, punishable by big fines and possible jail time. But there is one exception for what the government approves as legitimate scientific research. So it may not come as a surprise that Russ George is now clinging to that exception, justifying everything he did in the name of science. They've got the data they claim, 168 million pieces of it, that they also claim are being reviewed by a team of very important, yet apparently very secretive scientists. But that's precisely the problem, says John Cullen. Real science doesn't happen in secrecy. I have never reviewed a scientific experiment where the only uh, information on what happened came from journalists or a website. This is what the criticism is. That first of all, you did it in secrecy. Second of all, you didn't share. You didn't put this out there to have it assessed and to have it risk managed and all the kinds of things that normal uh, scientific experiments go through. You didn't do that. So they don't buy the fact who when said, you say this said, is a scientific says, experiment. How could they know what we did when they don't know all our methodologies? Well, that's their point. And they don't know that's all our their data. point. They, they say that is, if, if this was really a scientific experiment, they would know your methodologies. You'd put them out there. People would have an opportunity to look at them, to comment on them. <clears throat> there would be risk uh, and we'll assessments get there. done. Well, as we feel, we're right on schedule still. We're, but we're, you would we'll, do that before you go out and dump 100 tons of iron. Well, like, again, you're characterizing it as a dump. And it's 100 tons over a period of three weeks can hardly be characterized as a dump. And it's this, that kind of language it's been, has characterized this whole, this whole, uh, you know, this whole story. Whether it be illegal, dump, rogue, naive Indians. You know, we've heard it all and this, 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 this community has taken the brunt of it. So put the evidence out there. Well, we will. And it's being worked on now by third parties. It's not, it's not, it's not our, the only thing that's going to exonerate is, is if this is verified by gold star third party scientists. So who are the gold star third party scientists? At this point, our, our partnerships will be remain ours. I think any time someone says we have gold star scientists, it probably means they don't. What's more, says journalist Stephen Crivett, it's exactly the kind of self-serving, unverifiable claim Russ George is famous for. Science is about openness. Science is about trust. Sharing data. In my opinion, no, I, I, I can't believe anything that Russ George says that has a, a tinge of, uh, of, of scientific appearance without seeing what he's got to back that up. If he does have something to back that up, George is still not willing to share it. The company's lab in Vancouver is closed to reporters, and after initially agreeing to do an interview with the Fifth Estate, George shut us down too, insisting he'd only talk if he could approve everything we broadcast. 
Mr. George. Oh, Jillian Finley from CBC, Fifth Estate. How are you? I'd like to talk to you. We've been trying to talk to you for months now. Well, we've asked you many times. We've told you what we were willing to talk to you on. Well, we, we're here. We'd love to talk to you. You have nothing to say to us, Mr. George? The next day, we got a letter from the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation accusing us of having assaulted Russ George, which only underscores how strongly some in this community feel they've been misunderstood. The world should be applauding what this little village did, says Chief Ray, especially since they have every intention of doing it again. If I can make this sustainable, I, I would like to. You know, if you want to create your at absolutes and know everything you need to know to present a, a solid hypothesis, I guess. I'm learning all these new scientific words. It's going to take more than one year. After all the uproar, after everything you've gone through, you're, you're actually still at this point looking at doing it again. After all the uproar based on a whole bunch of inflammatory, mischaracterized words and not having any of the evidence to back their, their statements up. None of them. They, they have no evidence to back all these statements up. We have it. So where does that leave the Haida people? In Old Masset, their two and a half million dollars is gone. There will be no carbon credit return. And as for the fish, even if there is another bumper harvest some year, who will ever be able to say it was because of the iron? For Gloria Tauber, it's all part of a bitter pattern, a modern-day morality tale worthy of the traditional legends. When I saw that, I fully understood how our ancestors gave away our land for um, beads and blankets, you know, because it was so easy to convince some of them, you know. They were told that it was their only chance of salvation, so, you know, I guess they figured they had no choice. I hope this goes somewhere, that something is done out of it to set a precedent that this is not acceptable and that people shouldn't be blinded by greed. Now, there have been developments on Haida Gwaii. After our original broadcast, the Haida Salmon Restoration Corporation announced it was parting ways with Russ George in essence, firing him as company director and officer. 